All right. So what we want to do is just take a moment to welcome you all and to also welcome our speaker, um, Ann Bailey Lipset, to May's talk on Tuesday. We are going to be doing a deep dive into the neurodevelopment of social emotional development. Um, this is the first in a two-part series with Ann Bailey Lipset and as a continuation of our statewide theme and early intervention on um, better understanding and facilitating social emotional development in infants and toddlers and supporting families um, when their role of, um, of bringing out strong, healthy, well, socially, emotionally connected young children. Um, Ann Bailey hails to us from Lexington, Virginia. We are actually only a couple miles away from each other right now. And we have our daughters to thank for this Talks on Tuesday as they begged for a play date with these children. Neither one of us knew. And we met at a play date and these conversations started. Um, and um, I'm really thrilled that you guys get to have some of this um, learning and conversation and connection that I've gotten to have um, during my conversations with Ann Bailey. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Ann Bailey to introduce herself um, so you can understand her background a little bit more. Um, but I did wanna introduce to you one feature um, that we are going to use today that we haven't used in past talks on Tuesdays. And that is the Q&A um, option that is at the bottom of your screen or wherever your toolbar um, is for Zoom. So if you click the question and answer, um, that little Q&A section, that's a place to just put in questions that you'd really, that are directly related to the content that you'd really like to have answered. And if we're not able to get those questions answered within the conversation today or at the very end, we'll make sure that you all get answers to those questions, whether it's with a follow-up email and a blog post, or then also um, as part of the next presentation. So we'll make sure you get those answered. But then otherwise, the other engagement is going to happen through the chat. And if everything else will still be over there as usual. All right. Um, Ann Bailey, please introduce yourself and take it away. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm Ann Bailey Lipset. I am a special education author, and I had a book come out. I co-authored last year. I, um, on social emotional learning, and it's primarily for preschool through sixth grade. And I also just finished up a fellowship in infant parent mental health um, at UMass Boston. And so I felt like this book was really the accumulation of everything I learned. And then what's so exciting about being here today is that normally when I'm talking with your school age, the audience for my book, I'm talking about, well, what we would have liked to have happened in early development, but would have been this. And today I actually get to talk about what we do see, where it's like this, that you all are working in the moment with these families and children, which is so exciting to me. Um, so we're going to start off, we're going to look, start off looking at what attunement, and we'll look at what that is, what it looks like, and then what's going on, neuro what's the neurodevelopment piece behind attunement? Why is that so important? And then how do we support caregivers with it? Then we'll do the same thing with serve and return and with neuroception. Before we get into any of that, I want to look at really define what are we talking about when we say social emotional development in infants? Often it's much easier kind of to define it when we get into that elementary school or preschool age, because we're talking about how to share the crayons, how to calm down after Johnny share, steals your crayon, and how to you know set goals, pay attention in class, and all of these pieces. But when we're talking about infants, we're actually talking about that um, the foundational layer of development that's going to allow these little these children to grow up and have these social emotional skills that we're looking for in elementary school, adolescence, and beyond. So that first piece that we're looking for is that um, can the child engage in co-regulation when they're distressed? So you think about that infant that's crying and the mom, pick, the caregiver picks him up and just is rocking and holding. And does the child start to calm down? Do they can we accept that within about a 20 minute time frame? And when they do that, can they return to that regulated state and maintain it? And then while they're there, can they engage in the world around them? They observe it. Can they take joy and see that curiosity, um, take curiosity? So you'll kind of see that, you know, the infant that's kind of tracking the red ball and you're like, oh, look, they're, they're calm enough that they're able to engage and take in their world. And then 
are they able to participate in back and forth interactions? And we're going to get into that a lot more later on when we talk about serve and return. So attunement and what's going on with attunement. Our scholarly definition of attunement is really the parent's ability to recognize a child's signals, understand what those signals mean, respond appropriately, and then adjust those interactions to the child's needs. And I always think of this as, I think of myself as a sister-in-law and I'm always betting in my sister-in-law and I'm like, Oh, when my baby did that, this is what I did. And that's great and all good. I love talking about my own babies, um, but she doesn't necessarily need that. She can take that information, but what she's really looking at is the baby in front of her. And so that ability to kind of put the, all your mother-in-law, your sister-in-law thoughts aside, all those parenting books aside and keeping that information in mind, respond to the baby in front of you and what that might look like, what we actually see is that mutual gaze. And I don't know if any of you out there are floor timers, but Dr. Stanley Greenspan from the DIR floor time world calls this the mutual gaze that um, he called it falling in love. And so you see that infant and the caregiver, just like in this picture, they're just looking at, they're looking at each other in this way that it's like the rest of the world doesn't exist and just being held in this moment. You might see mirroring, so we see that, you know, the baby kind of widens eyes or makes a face and the caregiver automatically is just like, oh, makes that, um, makes that face right back or the baby stretches and the caregiver stretches. We might see mentalization, which is from um, Dr. Peter Fonagy's work, that idea that the caregiver is keep, is thinking about what that baby is thinking. And so it's, you know, oh, what is my you know, my baby is my baby following the baby's eye gaze. Oh, she's looking at her brother. Oh, I thought she wants to see her brother. Um, and just thinking about, you know, oh, she's uncomfortable. What is she feeling? Um, and then following and joining in on the child's natural rhythms. So this might be those macro, um, macro rhythms of meeting with the child where they are as far as when they need to eat and sleep. And then it might be those micro rhythms of, you know, you have a child who has got really high energy and you meet them with that higher energy and yes, let's go play. And then, you know, then you kind of tone, bring them down with you or that child who's slow to warm up. And so you see the caregiver meeting that instead of having high energy and saying, come on, come play with me. They meet that kind of meet that natural pace and rhythm of the child. So attunement, why all of this is important is because attunement actually facilitates that infant's neurodevelopment and lays that foundation for the individual's ability to emotionally regulate in times of stress. I think it's so important. You guys have this amazing, this field is so amazing because you're not, you're working with the cute infant and toddler, but what we're really doing is we're building, we're supporting an adult's, you know, an individual's future life as an adult. Um, attunement is saying to the infant, I see you because you are a being to be seen. And this is when that baby begins to recognize that they are a being. They recognize themselves. Attunement is building the capacity to regulate um, emotions. And then it supports that development of the medial prefrontal cortex, which we're going to get into why that's important in just a moment. But before we do, I want to take a moment and just visualize, think of a time that you experienced attunement, you and another individual working in this moment together. Think about what you might have seen, You he what did you hear, what did you physically feel, could you feel their presence, um, maybe their hand on your arm, maybe you were sitting in their lap, maybe they're in your lap, and then what did you emotionally experience? And if you um, are comfortable, I'd love it if you would share it in chat what these experiences were. I know for me, when I've experienced attunement, it's kind of like the world fades away outside me and it's just um, me and that infant right there. So. Um. Yes, Trisha said a sense of peace. That's it. Yeah, right there. Perfect. So we have to keep in mind, we get into the our neurodevelopment piece of this. 
um, at birth, all of our neurons already exist. They're there, but they haven't kind of formed those roadmaps that we're going to need for the rest of our life. All those synapses and neuropathways haven't been formed. And we form those from our interactions with others. So our interaction actions with infants are actually what is supporting this, these, the building of these neuropathways. So we're going to go ahead and do a poll. Um, and which area of which region of the brain do you think develops first? The brainstem, the limbic system, and the prefrontal cortex. Oh, and um, I'm just also noticing Sequoia in chat said that snuggling and talking to nephews. Yes. Oh, relax. And she said relaxed and whole. Yes, that's such a beautiful feeling with attunement, relaxed and whole. All right, so I'm watching this poll come in. You all are already so knowledgeable about this. It's all right, so it looks like most of you are saying that the brainstem is what develops um, is what develops first. So some of you saying limbic system. So let's get into that and what that looks like. Yes, there we go. There's are those regions. All right. So when we think about brain development, we're looking at the re brain develops from the bottom up and the top and the back to front, excuse me. So I like to think about this some of you, with the hand model of the brain. Some of you might be familiar with Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, which I, um, excuse me, um, I like to use with both parents and with kids as we're talking about the brain and talking about regulation. And so we have that brain stem right here that develops, that's your wrist. And then if you put your thumb right there in the middle of your hand, that's going to be your limbic um, system and your amygdala, which is right in there on your hippocampus. And then as you put your hand over it, you've got that prefrontal cortex right there. And so as we're thinking about brain development, we're keeping this in mind. We are thinking that it develop, the brain develops from bottom to top, back to front. And so the first part that develops is that brainstem. And we often call that um, the lizard brain or the reptilian brain because it's the part of that's been with us evolution-wise for the longest, the longest. And that's really responsible for just our body's automatic regulate regulating functions. It's res really responsible um, for keeping us in homeostasis or keeping us the same. So if we get too hot, it's the brainstem that's gonna regulate our temperature and help us sweat so we come back down. It's going to keep us, you know, our breathing regulated. It's going to kind of let us know when we're hungry. It's responsible for all of these, all of these basic functions that we're not even thinking about. The next part to development is uh, of brain development is the medial prefrontal cortex. And so this is responsible for emotional regulation and it begins to develop in your utero, but it's going to continue to develop into a person's 20s. So the whole time we're working with young people, we're working with a actively developing medial prefrontal cortex. And this houses the amygdala. So we go back to our hand model of the brain. We have our amygdala right there. And it is connected to the endocrine system by the hypothalamus. And that it kind of lets the endocrine system know when to release those stress hormones like cortisol. And so then we get into that amygdala and is often referred to as the smoke alarm of the brain. And as we know, smoke alarms spend their whole job is to detect something that's not right in the air and then to alert you that something's wrong. And that's exactly what your amygdala is doing. It's taking in all that information from your central nervous system that's traveling up, again, bottom up. It's traveling right in there. And your amygdala is what's going to make that decision is it okay for you to stay in a socially engaged state? Or do you need to go into a defensive state, like fight or flight? Or do you need to actually start shutting down and go into that free state? And this begins developing in that third trimester within that medial prefrontal cortex. And we'll, as when we talk about neuroception, we're going to talk a lot more about those states. Excuse me, and what they do. 
So then we have the insula, which is connects the visceral organs, that heart, intestine, skin, and it gives us those physical physical sensations of empathy. So when you're watching, when you're like, my heart actually hurts, like I feel and nothing happened to me, but I can physically feel it. That's from the insula. And this is a part of our emotionally regulated state. So I'm going to have um, someone else, Seth, to tell you what to do with this stamp feature. But I want you to think about a time when you've witnessed attunement. And what behaviors did you notice? And think about where they might live in that brain system. So the shared breathing patterns, the shared rhythmic patterns that you notice between a parent and a, or a caregiver and a child, the engaged state, the calm body, the relaxed facial expressions, and that whole leaning to each other, being attuned. So now we'll look at well, what is our role? Now that we know all of this neurodevelopment piece, what's our role in supporting that? And how can we support caregivers in that role? So I find all of the research that they've done on rats um, absolutely fascinating. So you're going to have to bear with me while I talk about them. Excuse me. Um, so what we have is They've studied rat pups and rat pups that live were brought up in what they called a high licking environment. So they had a mother that gave them lots of licks and was very attuned and was grooming them. Then they had another group of rats that were in a low licking environment. So they were, they got their basic needs met. They were fine, but they didn't get that grooming and caretaking that you got in the first group. And so what they found was that the high licking, the pups that grew up in that high licking environment grew up to be calm adults. And this was because that, that all that grooming and taking care of the rat pups actually turned on a gene in the pups that's involved in the cortisol release, which meant that as the rat pups became adults, they could achieve their baseline calm more quickly. So something could happen, you know, a cat could come up and scare them and they'd have a gnat, the cortisol release would come, they'd be able to take care of themselves and then go back to baseline. But in that low licking environment where they didn't receive the same grooming, that gene was not turned on, which meant that that cortisol release, just cortisol remained in the body even after the threat was gone. And these rats remained in a prolonged anxious state even after, like after that stressful experience was gone, after that, um, after that cat was gone. Whenever I think about that prolonged state, I think about that time, um, Mar you know, that spring of 2020, when that's what we were living in. It was, you know, even just doing something like getting groceries to feed your family was stressful because you're like, are you wiping them down before you come in the house? How do you get them? Are you getting them delivered? And does the guy delivering them have COVID? And we were all living in this kind of forever sense um, state of just anxiety. And so to think that that, but that was from an outside trigger, not from an internal, like once it was gone, hopefully most of us have been able to return to our baseline calm. So how do we support caregivers in this? Well, a big part is just helping them see the child in front of them, helping them block out the noise of the sister-in-laws that like me that are like, oh, you should do this and help them see the child that they need. And when we listen to them, help kind of start recognizing that sometimes the story they tell themselves might not might be a story that actually prevents them from connecting with the child. Um, I've worked with, and just even just from friends that and um, family that, you know, they say, you know, they're having difficulty with breastfeeding. They might say, oh, the child doesn't like me. Um, this child is, you know, he just doesn't want to be with me. Oh, she cries because she doesn't want me. She just wants her dad. Um, and these are things we hear all the time and that can actually prevent those kind of react um, comments can actually prevent this connection. So in that case, we have to start helping them reframe the baby's behavior. Oh, look, he's pulling away. He's pulling away because his stomach hurts. It's, not, you know, look at him. He's looking for your face while pulling away. So kind of helping them see the baby is looking for there's something else is wrong. It's not a personal moment. And then helping them understand the importance of interacting with the, ba the baby and the brain and what they're doing now, how important that is going forward. Um, and I think that, you know, we don't have to get into all the science, but that's where I feel like the hand model, the brain can be helpful. And sometimes just saying, I'm, you know, 
I don't like when they compare my babies to rat babies either, but on the, you know, off chance that they're right, why don't we try this? But, you know, kind of give them permission to interact with their children. And we will talk a lot more about that um, next month as we get into what might be getting to um, preventing families from interacting and getting to attunement. Um, so how do you help, help families connect and attune with their children? You all are very, um, have a lot of, back, there's a lot of background knowledge in this um, group and a lot of experience. So I would love it if you would put it into chat. How do you help families connect and attune? Yes, point out when it's happening because they don't always recognize it. That's exactly, um, exactly it. It's these moments and with everything else going on, sometimes it's so helpful to have someone point that out. Oh, yeah. So I said, put the phone away. Yeah. And helping see, oh, look, he's looking for you. Can you, oh, yeah. Oh, can you put that phone away? We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into serve and return. Yeah. Modeling how to slow down and watch that baby, pointing it out. Kind of in that wonder. I always like to point it out in such wonder of like, look, oh, just look at her turn her face to your voice. She hurt you, mama. Um, yeah, pointing out the energy. All right, I'm going to go on. Keep putting them in the chat because I think I want to come back and read everything you say. And I know you're reading and getting ideas from another. Um, all right, so let's get into serve and return. And so this is, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat um, because you guys have so many great ideas. Like, oh, wait, I have more to say on that. Moving on. All right. Serve and return. So the Harvard Center for Developing Child calls these interactions serve and return. In floor time, we call them circles. There's, I've heard, back and forth interactions, reciprocal communication. But this idea that um, someone starts the interaction and there's to a conversational partner and that person returns it and that you get this beautiful back and forth which I think serve and return is perfect because it makes you picture that tennis match of someone serving the ball and then someone returning it. And you're going for how long you can volley, how long you can have that friendly tennis match. See here, this is one of my favorite examples of serve and return. Um, so as you're watching it, I'd love it if you share in the chat what you notice. And I think this is a great example of Serve and return, we don't have to wait for our children to be communicating with words and to engage in serve and return. We should be doing it from the very beginning. Okay. Okay. They need to work on that, right? Yes, okay. Did you understand it though? No. Okay. All right. Oh, no. Not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of this. Okay, the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that again. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was thinking that, yeah. Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, but don't break it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I said. And then it was like, ah, 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 you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do that here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Really? I thought the same thing. <laughs> we think a lot alike, huh? <laughs> oh, that's crazy. <laughs> right. I see so many of you are saying, oh, I love this video. I feel like it doesn't matter how many times I've watched this video. I just get so much joy out of it. Um, and someone said, you can tell his family engages with him a lot. This is a little one that knows that um, their communication is valid. Yes. And you're seeing all of that. Dad is matching his rhythm. He's matching the child's rhythm. 
the mimicking, the hand motions, everything's meaningful. You all hit so many of those in the chat, love that video. And I've heard as family or practitioners that use that with parents as an example of this is something you can do. So we know that serve in return sub is, supports that early wiring and that early brain architecture. And it's re the repetition of the serve and return is actually improving those neural networks and that myelination to make it go faster. So it's easier for the child to do it again and again, which means frequent, this needs to happen frequently over and over, and it needs to be repetitive. It's not something we just ask a child a question and then we're done. And this, someone brought up phones earlier, and I know I am so guilty of this as a parent. I think we we all are, but we got engaged in this beautiful serve and return. And then we get an alert on our phone or our smartwatch um, and it we break it. We break that moment. And it's just something we've got to be careful with. We have to be sensitive to. And yeah, encouraging people to put our caregivers to put their phones away and that importance of holding that child in their serve and return reaction interactions for repeatedly over and over again. And this all is going to support that building a healthy stress response. Um, so I get, I really can nerd out on some of these research articles, but specifically about serve and return as they were first coming out in like 2017, 2018, about what the neuroimaging was showing. And this specific article showed that we had, there is actually a neural mechanism, which was, um, which was influencing brain development. And that children that engaged in more of these serve and return or conversational turns, they could see they had larger um, areas of activation in the Broca's area, which is where language processing comes. And that this explained, like it says, nearly half of the relationship between children's language abilities and their verbal abilities. And the title of this specific um, research study was Beyond the 30 mil Million Word Gap. Because when I was at first in school, we thought there was this there was this magical amount of words that children needed to be exposed to in order to be successful later in life. And I think a lot of you probably were very familiar with all this research as well. And it was the idea that we needed to just immerse children in language over and over again. Well, what all of these studies showed was that it actually isn't the amount of language the child hears. It's the amount of back and forth conversational turns that they're taking which we start to think about how we're using our storybooks and our read alouds. Because I know there was this idea that we just read, just read and read and read to the child because they need this language. But yes, reading to your children is wonderful and we should do it. And in no way I'm saying stop, but start to change thinking about how you're going to interact with that book. And so we have those families that say, oh, my child just will not sit still for a book. They won't listen. I'm just, I can't even read to them. And so we start thinking about, well, what if you, you know, look at what the, when you bring out that book, what is the child looking at? Oh, they're looking at the cow in the back of the picture. Even though the book's not about a cow, let's follow their lead on this. Oh, look, you see the cow on that picture? What's that cow say? And get into those back and forth serve and return. And kind of helping caregivers see how they can use these storybooks, not just to immerse their children in language, but to um, actually facilitate these back and forth. And so again, serve and return, it supports that identity of self and the idea of self, but also of another, that I'm here and you're there and we can interact and we can have what, you know, Peter Fonagy calls that we mode. We're together, but at the same time, we're two separate beings. It supports co-regulation. If a child is able to engage in that serve and return, when they're upset, they're also going to be able to engage in a caregiver. Hey, I know this character caregiver sees me and is going to respond to me. We also know that we need to be able to co-regulate in order to self-regulate later on. So another of um, serve and return research showed um, they this study measured the conversational tur turn counts in children between children and their caregivers, and they recorded families in the home. So what they found was that the conversational turn counts between 18 and 24 months predicted IQ, verbal comprehension, and expressive language skills when those children were nine and 13. And the key piece of this, it blew me away the first time I read this study, was that this remained significant even after they made adjustments for socioeconomic status and child language development. 
And to me, that was huge that this is why it's the back and forth interactions. It's getting those conversations going. So I probably am preaching to the choir. You all are very familiar with serve and return. How do you help families understand the importance of serve and return? Love it. Again, if you'll put that in the chat so we can learn from each other here. I think using like using the video is a great idea. Um, like I shared before about helping families see what they can do with storybooks. Beth, um, Beth says we have pointed out. And I think that's probably the best way instead of being telling a parent, okay, this is what you have to do. Look what you just did. You and your baby are in this process of serve and return. <gasps> yes, demonstrate it, model it, share in the excitement. All right, I'm gonna move on, but you all keep putting it in the chat so we can learn from each other. So what happens when we don't have serve and return, when it's absent? This, we, it's heartbreaking because we get this two, um, twofold, we miss two things. We, the baby misses the lack of stimulation, misses all those opportunities to engage in language and get engage with their caregiver and have those language experiences for getting them prepared for when they're nine to 13. And then they also have that stress response that's going to flood the brain. When you think back to those mice or to the rats, um, yeah, that they're not getting that ability to kind of put the brake on the cortisol release and say, okay, cool, I'm good now. I know I'm safe. So one of my absolute favorite ways to promote serve and return is through games and through the game of peekaboo. Think a minute for like, let's really break down peekaboo and what it is. And it's usually two people, not necessarily, but we've got two people and they're engaged in their engaged mutual engagement and they should both be enjoying it. And there's an element of surprise and anticipation. And so what studies have found is that in peekaboo, you get the mutual engagement gives both participants extra glucose and oxygen to the brain. Um, it triggers neuroanatomical growth for a sense of joy. And then in the parent's brain, brain scans have shown that it actually shows a deepening of attachment and well-being. So we're actually, a, you know, supporting the, the child, the parent's future ability to be able to tune with their child. And then it's increasing the pleasurable moments of endorphin receptors on the baby's amygdala, which is going to help downregulate it when needed, when in time of crisis. So a few years ago, I heard this amazing lecture from Dr. Gil Tippy of the Rebecca School, which is a floor time school in New York City. And he brought up, proposed, what if there is only one game in life? And that is the game of peekaboo. And you think about it, you're, anytime you're in sports, um, you're watching sports games. I think about like, when we're a big baseball family. So like watching the World Series, You've got that mutual, you're, you and the fans are together. You've got that mutual interaction. Um, and then it's like, are they going to catch the foul ball? Are they not? Is he going to hit him home run? Is he not? You think about going to Vegas and you're like, oh, where's the ball going to land on the roulette reel? What's the next card coming up? My husband and I used to joke when we first, you know, we're in this COVID thing and we had finally had those at-home COVID tests. It was this amazing, horrible game of peekaboo where you're like, <laughs> Do I get to leave my house in the next two weeks or am I stuck here? Peekaboo. Um, but it's all the anticipation that what's going to happen? Um, what happens next? And we know the companies are in on this, the toy companies, because they're while they're my girls, I have two girls, and they were really into those hatchimals. They were little eggs and you held them in your hand and then you like discovered what animal you hatched. Those things were so popular just because of the anticipation. So when we think about peekaboo, um, we think about maybe there's, there's other ways to play peekaboo when you start to think about, well, let's take what it is and expand it. So any anticipation game. So any kind of like that safe version of, um, hide and seek, like, where's my friend? <gasps> is you hiding behind that chair? Or even just that you have a little cloth and where's your foot? Oh, where's my foot? There it is. Um, yes, I just saw someone in the chat put in that TED talk on peekaboo can change the world. Go to that. Yes, absolutely. I'm obsessed with peekaboo. Um, so the I'm gonna get you. 
And the thing, so this, like you, you know, can start either if you're holding the animal or you're kind of playing that you're going to come get them and it's all, you're all, you're attuned. So you're never going to like scare the child It's never, I'm going to get you. And we're being very respectful of what that child, where that child is comfortable with any sort of touch. So maybe it's a stuffed, you have a stuffed animal and it's going to get you on the outside of your shoe. And then, but you're going to keep changing it up. And so you're kind of playing with your rhythm. So there's still that element of surprise. I'm going to get your nose. I'm going to get your ear. And to get, again, get um, into that anticipation back and forth. Um, and like you all said, modeling this for parents and seeing that it's, you know, it's such a, I feel like when you're a parent, you get so bogged down with everything else you have to do in your house. And so having something that they've seen before, I feel like, oh, wait, I can play this silly game and I can play it on the changing table. Um, puppet play. The puppet's hiding. The puppet comes and pops out. Where is he? Um, that's one. And then my ultimate favorite, because we all have Amazon these days, is oh, what's in the box? <laughs> What could be in that box? Um, very natural. Anytime the Amazon box comes, we, when we lived in Northern Virginia and we were there for about 16, 17 years, we were, we got a farm share. And so it would be delivered on Wednesdays and my kids would be so excited. Like, what could it be? Like shake it. And then, we, you know, oh, make all these predictions. And then you're like, oh, radishes. <laughs> And today, this day, this is the only time they've ever eaten radishes is if it came from the anticipation in the farm share box. But so again, use all of this. So you're just drawing out those rhythms of serve and return. So what these games do, what research has shown is that it actually engages the prefrontal medial cort cortex, which is like involved in your kind of sending signals to your whole body and that emotional regulation. It releases anticipation games, release that dopamine. And this study found that this anticipation is present at four months in infants. So this is something that is intrinsic, it's an intrinsic brain response. And this matches some research we've seen in rats where they tried to see, well, okay, rats really like tickling games. Well, where does that live in the rat's brain that they have this um, response to tickling? And what they found was that it actually lives in the brainstem, which tells us this is an ancient response that if we didn't need to have these playful anticipation, these playful exchanges, we would have gotten rid of it long ago from ev an evolutionary standpoint. So it really is kind of this primal response that we need, like we engage in play. All right. So what are your favorite peekaboo and anticipation games to play? You know, I've shared even with those kids who aren't into books, even just sharing the um the game. Oh, the Achu game. Yes, that is a good one. I'm gonna get you. Yep, mystery box. <gasps> All right, again, you guys keep it coming. I'm gonna look at it later as we go on. Um, as you they're so good, I keep getting distracted. <laughs> All right, so let's go on to neuroception. And neuroception is a term coined by Dr. Stephen Porges, and but it's also used often by um, Bruce Perry and I think Dan Siegel. And it's kind of that idea, they almost think of it as your spidey sense that you know, um, you, it kind of tells you whether or not you're safe. It's thinking back to what we talked about with that amygdala. And I always think about a time when I was in my 20s in DC on the Metro. And, you know, I took the Metro every day and I was fine. And then one day I was like, we have, to, I have to get off. And as I tried to get off, I got off, but you could see the person who had like behind me trying to get off too and stuck in the crowds. And it was just like, you know, something's not right. And your body's taking in information and without you even processing it, it's determining whether or not you're safe. And so we have this, this, and we all have this neuroception. And next month, we're going to talk about faulty neuroception when it doesn't go right. Um, things just aren't quite, we're not, um, where it's just things aren't quite lining up. When we think about this and we think about neuroception, we have to go back to that brain development of that we take information in from the bottom up. And so we're looking at those lower regions of the brain are going to take in the information from around us. It's not something from up top. And as we think about 
um, how we usually interact with kids who are having a hard time. So often we say, take a deep breath. You're okay. Let me, or even like, oh, I know you're sad. You're scared. We're doing that labeling emotions. And I'm sorry, my, I thought my cat was locked out of the room. I guess not. Um, but all of that, when we're even just using any of that verbal input, that's coming at it from the top down. And so while our attentions are to co-regulate, for some kids, that's not what it's going to do. What we really need to be able to do with them is sit and breathe with them. Thinking back to that attunement piece we talked about, where you're matching the rhythms, you're matching the bra- the breathing patterns, they're rhythmic. And that's what's going to help a child get into their co, um, kind of get back into a space of being calm. So when we are, amygdala detects a place of being in um what's going on. I'm sorry about my cat. Um, it, the amygdala is going to decide kind of whether or not we can stay in social engagement so we can keep on doing what we're doing, which doesn't mean we're not stressed. It means we're stressed just enough that we can still access our prefrontal cortex. We can make all those good executive decisions that we need to do to be productive. Or we're going to um, need to go into a defensive state of flight or flight, or do we need to start shutting down like in freeze? So let's look at what goes into all of those. We have that um, social engagement. And so Dr. Stephen Porges research here is what really um, talks about a lot of this and that when we are in a social engagement state, our parasympathetic system um, is active and we so which means we can be relaxed. And that's actually connected with our facial, the muscles in our face through the vagus nerve. And so that's what allows us to have um, positive emotions that are conveyed through our face, our facial response. And we're going to see it in your, um, the tone, your tone, your rhythm, the prosody of your voice, that rhythmic back and forth. Um, and Darwin, actually, I found this super interesting that he wrote that it was, he believed it was our capacity for developing with these emotions, these, this reaction, the set of muscles that allowed us to develop connections. That's really what allowed us to survive and thrive. So what happens if we get into that fear response? Our sympathetic system is activated and it takes over and that's when we get that adrenaline release and then our heart rate and our blood pressure increase. And now if you go back to that hand model, the brain, and some of you might've done this with your um, kids before, but that's actually, you have that prefrontal cortex is no longer connected. So you can tell kids, it's like you pop your top or you flip your lid your amygdala is taking over to help you survive. Now that other state, that freeze state, this is that response to either an overwhelming threat or um, an ongoing, it might be ongoing little um, stressors. So your body has had cortisol going through it for too long. It says, hey, we've got to start pulling back. We've got to shut down. And so what happens is that that primitive unmyelinated Vegas takes over and you actually lose the facial expression um, face it. Those muscles kind of stop working. And so that's when you see that really low affect. Someone's not responding. They might be furious, but you're not seeing it on their face because they've lost the, like that connection. And then your ear actually loses its ability to hear all the full range of sounds, which is part of why when you have someone that's really stressed, noise is going to be a very big threat to them more than others. And then you get into that disassociation. That idea of the brain is like, I'm going to be anywhere but here. Let's go. And these are all, of course, normal, um, our normal reactions to stress. And so I want you to think back to your work with infants and toddlers. And when have you seen these responses? And you're going to use the SAMP feature again. I'm thinking about those social responses you see. You know, think about what we talked about at two minutes. So looking at what do we do when our children are in these states? And how do we help our caregivers? Um, Dr. Bruce Perry calls this the three R's, regulate, relate, and reason. And in that order, because if you, you need to have a child, then you need to co-regulate that child before you can even start relating to them, using that language um, or reasoning with them. Hey, what way are you going to do next time? Oh man, that was a big reaction. Do you think that was a big deal or little deal? You know, all of that is great to talk about once they're calm, maybe not even that day, later that day. So we regulate, we breathe with them. We join them in a rhythmic regulating activity. So walking, swinging, um, 
rocking. My favorite with older kids is coloring during COVID. I just ordered a whole bunch of coloring sheets from like huge coloring sheets so that we could all sit there and color. It's rhythmic. Um, and, but not have to talk to each other because you can join someone in a rhythm with, and be attuned with them without actually having to stress those other areas of their brain. But we all know while that's all perfect and great, and we know we should do that. There's all, we always have times that our child is in target and they want something that we have already said no to three times and we're late. And we know our boss is around the corner watching us because why do we live in a small town? And we pick up the kid and we just leave or we, whatever we do, because that's what happens. <laughs> um, none of us, nobody can be the perfect parent. And I would, I put my, all of my faith in <laughs> is Edgeponic's work on rupture and repair. And this idea that actually a, the good enough parent only meets their child's needs 30% of the time. They only catch their child's cues. They attune with them only 30% of the child, the time, the other 70%, they might, the parent might've, you know, kind of lost it, lost their temper, or they might just not be missing. They might be misinterpreting these cues. And that's exactly what should happen. If you've got that strong 30% base, the rest of the time that child is learning that it's okay to be, have a rupture in a relationship or have a mismatch because you're going to repair it. So you're not going, it's not the end of that relationship. You're not abandoned forever. You are going to come back and rejoin it. And that's actually that knowing that repair will come, will help children return to baseline if they've experienced that. And that's what builds resiliency. That's what we want our kids to be able to do when, you know, a teacher loses, um, loses their patience. And that doesn't mean the teacher doesn't love them and hates them forever. It means that teacher is going to, you know, we just need to come back and repair. And as a parent, I hang on to the idea of rupture and repair with all of my might, because otherwise I would be very hard on myself. So a few takeaways from today, um, just keeping in mind that all of those interactions we do with our little ones support are supporting neurodevelopment and that building of that brain architecture. All the interactive games that we do, the peekaboo, the silly anticipation, you guys put so many good stuff, so much good things in chat. Um, all of that supports the developing architecture of the child's brain. And then that other huge piece of helping caregivers understand those neurological states and how to respond to them appropriately with the grace that we don't always respond appropriately, but we hide and repair. Um, but I think so much of that helps them. Again, it helps them see the kid isn't doing this at me. <laughs> They're not trying to throw a tantrum to get me. This is just what happens. All right. And so next month we will get into... Um, how do we support families when there's these factors that interfere with all the beautiful, wonderful things we talked about today, whether that's from um, the child being, um, you know, from the child's perspective, there's some development, might be some development mental differences going on, whether it's from the family's perspective, the caregiver's perspective, or from the environment that in the communities around the family. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank and you. thank you, Ann Bailey. This was wonderful. And even this is the second time that I've um, had the pleasure to hear this, and I learned something new um, as well. So a couple of additional pointers um, that I get to take back with me. So thank you. I'm really excited for our next session together. Um, we did have one question that came into the chat. Um, and this was from Trish. Uh, Trish, I don't know if you want to um, maybe clarify after I give the question, but um, your question was, how long into an infant's life do we think we have to give them the benefits of, and I believe you're referring to attunement, so kind of how long um, do we need to, to really be um, in the serve and return back and forth, really making sure that we're giving them this early high licking environment? Okay, so my first response is I don't. No, I'm going to go and research that and ask that. And I will be back in touch with you. I will bring that up next month. What I do. So in this fellow infant parent mental health fellowship, I just went through, um, uh, there were some people it taking, going through the fellowship that were working with adolescents and they kept bringing up all of this research on like how important all of this is to adolescents. And my takeaway from that as a parent was like, 
I really thought I did a good job and I thought I was done. And now you're telling me that I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, all that work I did when they were little <laughs> needs to, it's like even more important with, as they're starting to, you know, grow and change. Not that I was going to quit parenting, but um, so I don't know, but I, I think it's almost, I, I'm going to look it up for you, but from conversations I've had, I feel like it's actually a field that we don't, we might not know, um, and that people are really looking at this, but this idea yeah. that there's, we, you know, now know that the brain continues developing and that there's now we are starting to be aware that there's teen years, the brain development that happens in those years is really, um, essential as well. So I don't think I answered your question but I will. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, sometimes the best, the best answer is, I don't know, but I will find out. So thank you for doing some further investigation for all of us. Um, so you all, um, the next steps are, um, as we thank very much, thank you, Anne Bailey, for pulling all of this together um, for us. She very specifically pulled this together for us. So this wasn't something she rehashed. She really um, thought about us um, as an EI community and um, and what is it that we really you know, want to sink into and take a deep dive into when it comes to neurodevelopment. So as we close, please remember to go check your inbox. You're going to have a survey there from us. Once you take that survey and submit it, then you will get um, a certificate that you can download to um, note your um, continued education that you received an hour of training today with us. Please um, can send us any questions or comments that you have, and we hope to see you all. You are all already pre-registered for next month, June's Talks on Tuesday, so we hope to see you all then um, and spread the word as well. Also, this will be recorded and will be placed um, in our Talks on Tuesday section on our website along with the handout. Um, and don't do definitely refer to that handout if some of those terms you need kind of a refresher on or you need to um, uh, kind of reread and, um, and take a little bit more from it. So anyway, all right. Thank you all. We will see you next month. Thank you all.